So I got one. Three weeks ago, I made a video saying that no one should buy the Samsung Freestyle projector because the price was too high and the specs were too low. I also passed judgment on Samsung for flooding YouTube with paid reviews that clearly didn't let those reviewers speak openly about the Freestyle's problems. A lot of you agreed with me, but there were also quite a few comments pointing out that I shouldn't write off the Freestyle without testing it myself, which I actually agree with. Except it wasn't possible because the only people who had the projector were those paid influencers. But now I have one, so we can finally get some unbiased testing to see if my earlier advice to steer clear holds up or if I'm going to have to eat my words. For better or for worse, the Samsung Freestyle is mostly being marketed at people who have never owned a projector. So if you fall into that category, here are all the things that you might not have thought of that will make or break your projector experience. And today on The Hookup, we're going to test them all. Starting with brightness. Samsung's pre-order page lists the brightness of the Freestyle at 550 lumens, which sounds great. However, lumens is an ambiguous term for projectors, and if the listing doesn't specifically say anti-lumens, then you shouldn't trust it. The anti-lumen is the accepted standard for measuring projector brightness, and it's calculated by taking a different brightness measurement at nine different zones on an all-white screen, then averaging those measurements and multiplying by the screen size in square meters to get the anti-lumens. According to my actual testing, the Samsung Freestyle comes in at 240 ANSI lumens, which means that the 550 lumens listed on the pre-order page are referring to something called LED lumens and unfortunately not ANSI lumens. To show where the Freestyle fits in with the current portable projector market, I also selected two other projectors to compare in this video. First is the new XGME Halo Plus because it has a similar feature set and MSRP to the Freestyle. And the second is the XGME MOGO Pro, which is a considerably cheaper 1080p alternative with similar specs to the Freestyle. And yes, for full transparency, I did ask XGME to send me these projectors for the purpose of making this specific video, but that was the extent of our relationship. And unlike the sponsored Samsung videos, XGME doesn't have any control over the content of this video. And as always, there are no sponsored reviews on my channel. Anyways, the MOGO Pro's brightness was very similar to the Freestyle with 237 ANSI lumens, while the Halo Plus clocked in at a comparatively huge 665 ANSI lumens, almost triple the brightness of the Freestyle. A 400 lumen brightness difference at this level is a huge deal, and you should expect the MOGO Pro and Freestyle to only be usable in a mostly dark room with zero chance of being able to be used outside during the daytime, no matter how shady it is. You also shouldn't expect miracles from the 665 ANSI Lumen Halo Plus, but it will at least give you a fighting chance for a small to medium sized screen during the day and will allow you to use it in a room with the blinds open or some lights on. In the first category, brightness, the Halo Plus is the clear winner with the Freestyle barely edging out the MOGO Pro for second place. However, I have shown in my other projector videos that more brightness doesn't always lead to a better viewing experience if things like clarity and contrast are sacrificed. So to evaluate their overall picture quality, I set up each projector with a 100 inch screen in a mostly dark room and I used the same manual settings on my Sony A6600 to record each one. As I said, the brightest image isn't always the best, but in this case, the Halo Plus's additional brightness didn't come with any losses in clarity or black level. And as a result, the video from the Halo Plus had much better contrast and looked significantly more dynamic and vibrant than the other two projectors. Two scenes where the contrast was especially noticeable were the kayaker scene from the Dolby Atmos test video, where you could really see the kayaker popping out against the waterfall, and also in the leaves on the banister from Encanto that looked like they actually had sunlight shining on them on the Halo Plus, versus the other projectors that didn't have enough brightness to show the highlights properly. During picture quality testing, I normally also critique color accuracy, but the Freestyle and the Halo Plus have enough advanced picture settings to let you dial in whatever particular color palette you prefer. So I don't think it's really necessary. I was also impressed by the advanced picture settings on both the Halo Plus and the Freestyle, which offered things like local contrast enhancement and motion blur compensation. Surprisingly, I actually preferred to have these settings enabled at least at a moderate level on both projectors, even though those are usually the first things that I turn off when setting up a new TV. Unfortunately, the MOGO Pro has a more basic set of picture options, but it still lets you adjust things like brightness, contrast, saturation, sharpness, noise reduction, and color temperature. With all that said, the Halo Plus definitely had the best picture quality and overall viewing experience, and between the MOGO Pro and Freestyle, it was pretty close, but I think I actually preferred the MOGO Pro's image slightly compared to the Freestyle, which consistently looked a little too flat and muted for my preference. So the last important part for overall viewing experience is sound quality. And unfortunately, conveying sound is pretty hard on a YouTube video. But one thing that I definitely know is that it's impossible to do without a comparison. So with that in mind, here are the three projectors up against a Sonos One SL as a baseline for what a good speaker should sound like. This is Dolby Atmos. 
the number of speakers around you no longer matters. Because this is the world's first object-based cinematic audio. With powerful moving audio that transcends from channels to moving around you with pinpoint accuracy. Whether the soundscape sets the mood of the scene. Whoa. Come on, you guys, let's go. I do have to give credit where credit is due. The freestyle does sound really good for just a single five watt speaker. But between the three projectors, I don't think there's any question that the Halo Plus is both louder and higher quality than both the freestyle and the Mogo Pro. And the freestyle comes in in an easy second place. The viewing experience categories were dominated by the Halo Plus, but a lot of people said the freestyle wasn't just about the specs. So let's move on to the ease of use categories, starting with portability. For overall size, the Mogo Pro is slightly smaller than the freestyle and the Halo Plus is considerably larger. As for their weight, the freestyle is the lightest at 774 grams and then the Mogo Pro at 905 grams. And last, the Halo Plus is a pretty big boy at 1688 grams. Based on this, it might be tempting to think of the Freestyle as the most portable of these projectors, but that would be overlooking one huge issue. The Freestyle doesn't have a built-in battery, so you always need a power cord, and if you want true portability, you also need to carry a battery bank. And not just any battery bank. In fact, I spent a little over $200 on Amazon trying to find one that could power the Samsung Freestyle. And for reference, I now know that the battery bank has to support 9 volt charging at at least 3 amps. None of these other quick charge compatible battery packs worked in the Freestyle because they have less than 3 amp output at 9 volts. The battery that did end up working was this 20,000 milliamp hour pack that weighed in at 490 grams, which brings the total weight of the portable Freestyle to a little over 1300 grams, which is much closer in weight to the Halo Plus than it is to the Mogo Pro, putting the Mogo Pro in first place for being the most portable over these projectors, and I guess the Freestyle can be in second based on its size, but I personally prefer an all-in-one style like the Halo Plus rather than needing to carry around an external battery and cord like the Freestyle. Related to that, how much portable playtime should you expect from that big 20,000 milliamp hour battery pack? I ran battery drain tests using full brightness on the Freestyle and Mogo Pro, which remember is about 240 ANSI lumens. And I adjusted the brightness of the Halo Plus to be the same 240 ANSI lumens to be able to compare apples to apples. In my testing, after just 55 minutes, the Mogo Pro automatically reduced its brightness to eco mode to conserve battery and then lasted an additional 57 minutes. The Samsung Freestyle ran at full brightness for one hour and 32 minutes before depleting its entire battery bank and powering off automatically. In contrast, the Halo Plus was able to maintain playback at 240 ANSI lumens for two hours and 14 minutes before automatically switching to eco mode for an additional 34 minutes, making it the clear winner in the battery life category, followed by the Freestyle and then the Mogo Pro in third. It is worth noting that you could bring multiple battery banks for the Freestyle to get more playtime, but since there's no internal battery and just a single USB-C port for power, there's no way to hot swap the batteries without turning off the projector in the middle of your movie. Speaking of ports, let's talk connectivity. The only two ports on the Freestyle are a micro HDMI port and the USB-C power port, which again, will always be used for power since there's no internal battery. By contrast, the Mogo Pro and Halo Plus both have very standard connectivity with a USB port to play files directly off of a thumb drive, a standard HDMI port, and a three and a half millimeter headphone jack. On the Freestyle, I was able to use a USB-C hub with charging pass-through to play local files off of a thumb drive, but since micro HDMI is pretty uncommon and the USB-C port needs to be plugged into power, you're pretty much always going to need some kind of adapter for the Freestyle. So for connectivity, the Freestyle is definitely in third place with the Mogo Pro and Halo Plus tied for first since they have identical ports. Next in ease of use is keystoning, which is one of the most heavily advertised features on the Freestyle. The Freestyle and Halo Plus have horizontal and vertical auto keystone, but in my testing, the Halo Plus version worked significantly better. To test the keystone correction range, I used three different locations for each projector. The first at 35 degrees horizontal offset and zero degrees vertical. The second at 22 degrees horizontal and 22 degrees vertical. And the third at zero degrees horizontal and 45 degrees vertical. Not only did I have a hard time getting the auto keystone to trigger on the freestyle, but I found that even after it did, the keystone wasn't perfect. And unlike the Halo Plus's implementation, it didn't immediately give the option to correct any errors, meaning the process almost always took significantly longer than it should have. 
Hopefully the Freestyles Auto Keystone is able to be fixed in a software update because it definitely needs it to come close to the ease of use and accuracy of the Halo Plus, which easily took first place in this category. And I guess I'll give the Freestyle second place for occasionally getting the Auto Keystone correct. But in reality, the Mogo Pro was actually easier to get set up properly in most cases, even without auto keystoning. And as a quick extension to this section, I also want to talk about ceiling projections, since a bunch of people said that that was the killer feature of the freestyle. And I got multiple comments asking which other projectors could project on a ceiling. Well, the answer to that is all of them. You just point the projector at the ceiling. In the case of the freestyle, you do get a convenient 180 degree stand, but ceiling projection isn't some special technology. And as you can see, the Halo Plus does just as well, or maybe even better than the freestyle, by just laying it down on its back. Next up, let's talk about smart TV app compatibility. The freestyle runs Samsung's Tizen OS, which is the same operating system that runs on its Samsung smart TVs, while the Mogo Pro runs Android TV 9, and the Halo Plus has Android TV 10. While Tizen OS isn't my favorite, it definitely has the best app compatibility based on one single app, Netflix. For whatever reason, even though there is a Netflix app for Android TV, you can't just install it on any Android TV device. Instead, each device needs to be individually Netflix certified to be able to use the native app, which is a limitation that's implemented by Netflix. Unfortunately, neither the Halo Plus nor the Mogo Pro are Netflix certified devices. So to be able to use Netflix, you have to load the desktop version with another app called Desktop Manager. And while that means you can technically make it work, the whole experience is a little bit janky and definitely not ideal. For screen mirroring, the Freestyle can cast directly from a Samsung phone and surprisingly also supports Apple AirPlay. The only issue would come if you had a non-Samsung Android phone, which would require you to do some workarounds. By contrast, the Halo Plus and Mogo Pro only officially support Chromecast mirroring, and even though you can download an app called AirScreen to enable AirPlay, it's definitely not as easy to use as the native AirPlay support on the Freestyle. One other unique thing about Tizen OS is Samsung's TV Plus app, which lets you browse through free live content, sort of like basic cable. And even though I can't see myself using it regularly, I do think it's a pretty cool feature and it further cements the Freestyle's win in app compatibility, with the Halo Plus coming in in second place with Android 10 and the Mogo Pro in third with Android 9. But I'm definitely not done talking about Tizen OS and specifically how the Freestyle's processor handles it. If I had to pick the one worst thing about the Freestyle, it is definitely the lagginess of the interface. I'm not sure if this is something that's gonna get fixed in a future software update, but wow, it is a terrible user experience. Button presses take way too long to respond, menus and apps are slow to load, and most annoyingly, Tizen tries to play whatever's in the background while you're in other menus, resulting in an even more laggy experience. By contrast, the Android TV interfaces on both the Halo Plus and the Mogo Pro are extremely intuitive, easy to use, and extremely responsive. I do like Android 10 slightly more than Android 9, and the Halo Plus does an especially good job of loading programs quickly. I also like that on both the Halo Plus and the Mogo Pro, they have all the important settings easily accessible from a button on the remote, instead of needing to navigate to the settings menu from the home page like you do on the Freestyle. For user interface and operating system performance, the Halo Plus is in first, the Mogo Pro is in second, and in a distant third place is the Freestyle. So that wraps up the ease of use category and things are still looking pretty bad for the Freestyle. The last section includes a couple things that you may or may not care about depending on how you plan to use your projector starting off with fan noise. One thing that I can tell you is that in general, portable projectors tend to be extremely quiet compared to traditional ball projectors or laser projectors, and these are no exception. So with that said, here is exactly what they sound like. So while none of the projectors were problematically loud, the Samsung Freestyle was definitely the loudest and the Mogo Pro was definitely the quietest. The second thing that you may or may not care about is latency or input lag. Basically, if you plan to play video games with your projector, the latency is the amount of time between when your game console sends out the video signal and then when the image appears on the screen. As a general rule, latency under 50 milliseconds is indistinguishable for everybody except for the most hardcore gamers. Between 50 and 100 milliseconds starts to feel a little bit funny, but it's mostly tolerable, and latency above 100 milliseconds makes playing video games difficult and a lot less fun. The more image processing a projector does for things like keystone correction and contrast enhancement, the more latency it'll introduce. So first, let's look at latency in normal picture mode with image processing and keystoning. 
To do this, I send a split HDMI signal to my LG C9 TV that has a well-tested latency of 13 and a half milliseconds, and then I measure how many frames behind the TV each projector is. I multiply that number by 16.6, .6, and then I add 13.5 milliseconds for the delay of the C9. Using these settings, I really wouldn't recommend any of these projectors for playing games, but thankfully they all have gaming mode to reduce the image processing for a faster response. In gaming mode, you can see that the Halo Plus did the best with just 30 milliseconds of latency, and the Freestyle and Moga Pro were just one frame behind that for a total of 47 milliseconds. That means that the Halo Plus had the lowest latency in gaming mode. However, I am not going to give it the first place finish because the gaming modes of both the Halo Plus and the Mogo Pro disable keystoning, while the Samsung Freestyle can still keystone and maintain that 47 millisecond input lag, so first place in this category needs to go to the Freestyle with the Halo Plus in second and the Mogo Pro in a close third. And that wraps up all the normal projector stuff, but there are a few other features that were advertised in the sponsored video that I need to talk about. First. Putting the lens cap on your projector and calling it an ambient light lamp is ridiculous. Not only does the ambient light mode look pretty lame, but this is a $900 projector with a maximum lamp life of around 20,000 hours. If you want a colored light, an RGB light bulb costs $20. Not only is an RGB light bulb cheaper, more convenient, quieter, and brighter than the Freestyle, they're also about five times more energy efficient, and they won't waste your $900 projector's limited LED lifespan. Second, the Freestyle is supposed to have auto color correction that detects the color of your wall and modifies the projected image to correct for a non-white wall. However, the implementation of this feature is not exactly convenient. Not only do you need to have a compatible cell phone, but you also need to have added your projector to Samsung SmartThings, and then you need to run the calibration process on your phone anytime you move the projector. So while this feature does technically exist, it shouldn't be thought of as automatic like the keystone correction and focus adjustments, and I imagine most people aren't gonna use it at all. So after all that, it's time to answer the question, is a Samsung Freestyle worth $899? Definitely not, especially considering you also need to buy a $50 battery bank if you want true portability and adapter cables if you wanna match the functionality of similar projectors. The Samsung Freestyle does do a few things pretty well, but it mostly performs like a projector that costs roughly half as much. More importantly, I question the overall usefulness of a projector that has less than 300 ANSI lumens anyways, because even in a mostly dark room, that isn't enough brightness to properly show high contrast content. And I think anyone who buys this as a TV replacement is gonna immediately regret their decision. Some people will inevitably think that I am a Samsung hater or an ex Jimmy shill, but neither of those things are the case. The truth is that this video isn't gonna make me any friends at Samsung, but it did need to be made because taking pre-orders while simultaneously flooding YouTube with paid reviews is super shady business that's bad for consumers and it's bad for YouTubers. If you're wondering what I hope to gain from this video telling you not to buy something, the answer is simple. Hopefully just your trust and maybe a new subscriber. Speaking of which, thank you to all of my patrons over at Patreon for your continued support on my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.